Hello. Welcome to the second installment of Black Cat Theology. This is a series of lectures devoted to the later philosophy of Martin Heidegger and its relation to contemporary non-metaphysical theology. These lectures are based upon my book that has just been published by Palgrave Macmillan, Non-Metaphysical Theology After Heidegger. Now, in my first lecture, after introducing myself and providing some of my own intellectual background, I presented the basic problem space that will be occupying us more or less throughout the remainder of these lectures. I devoted particular attention to an interesting claim made by the Swiss theologian Heinrich Ott to the effect that there exists an interesting correspondence between, on the one hand, later Heidegger's thinking about non-metaphysical being and the holy, where that includes the gods, the godly, and the last god, and on the other hand, contemporary, non contemporary theology. Now, I argue that Ott's claim is premature because in order for there to be a fruitful correspondence, or any kind of correspondence for that matter, between Heidegger's later thinking about non-metaphysical being in the holy on the one hand and theology, there needs to be a coherent body of thought about those topics in Heidegger's later writings. The problem is that initially it doesn't look like there is any such coherent body of thought. And if there isn't, then there's no correspondence between anything interesting in Heidegger's later writings and theology of any kind. Now, the reason that that doesn't seem to be anything coherent in Heidegger's later writings is that there are at least three different proto-theologies, I call them. That is, three different blueprints that set forth very different understandings of the relations among being non-metaphysically construed, the holy, and beings. So it looks like Heidegger is contradicting himself. And so he's not setting forth any kind of coherent body of thought about non-metaphysical being and the holy that could stand in a fruitful correspondence with theology. Now, what I want to do in this lecture is begin to examine these three proto-theologies. And I'm only going to examine the first two this time. And I will discuss the second one, I'm sorry, the third one in my next lecture. What I'm going to argue today is that with the first two proto-theologies, there are problems that arise for them that are internal to Heidegger's later philosophy. In other words, within the terms of Heidegger's later philosophy itself, we can see why he should reject these two proto-theologies, even though he suggests them at different times and at different places in his later writings. I'm going to come back to the third one next time because I don't want the lecture to run too long. Now, a second conclusion that I want to draw from this, or we're beginning to work our way towards, is that, and it's a salutary conclusion for those of us who want to see some value for theology in Heidegger's later philosophy, and that is that when we reflect on it, even if it's not initially apparent, there is a discipline formed of inquiry that comes out of reflecting on Heidegger's later texts where we can argue for or against a particular position or proto-theology that's been set forth. It's not just like anything goes. It's not just like, well, we can you know, make it up as we go along. It's that there's, there's a difference between getting it right and getting it wrong, and that we can see this drawing upon the terms that Heidegger himself provides us. There's a disciplined inquiry there, and that begins to militate against the skeptical conclusion that there's no coherent thinking about non-metaphysical being and the holy in Heidegger's later writings. And so that's what I want to do today. Now, let's get right to it. Remember that the first proto-theology that Heidegger suggests has it that being is um, not the same as the holy. The holy is not the same as being. The holy, rather, is a particular being. God is a being. And a lot of people who probably think about religious issues would construe or think about God as a being. So God, a.k.a. the holy, is not, not being per se, but is a particular being. Heidegger suggests this view in the following passage from his 1935 series of lectures, Introduction to Metaphysics, the Einführung zur Metaphysik in German. Heidegger writes, a chasm, or chorismos, that's the Greek word for chasm, 
was created between the merely apparent essent here and real being somewhere on high. In that chasm, Christianity settled down, at the same time reinterpreting the lower as the created and the higher as the creator. The essent is the English translation for Heidegger's word for beings as a whole. So within the essence, that is beings as a whole, there are the beings down here, the lower beings, and then there's the being, the higher being up there, and that's God. And so God is being treated, it's being suggested, that God is a particular being. He just happens to be a higher being, whereas the other beings are lower ones. Now, this claim is advanced against the background of a certain metaphysical conception pertaining to God and creatures. According to this metaphysical conception, and it's actually a metaphysical conception of being, it's a metaphysical conception of being because it treats being as the maximally general characteristic that is common to all particular beings. And what is that characteristic according to this framework or this conception? Well, it's something like to be is to have an ultimate explanation. In the case of created beings, the lower ones, their ultimate explanation consists in the fact that they are created by God. With God, the higher being, his being or his having an ultimate explanation consists in being a causa sui, as Heidegger puts it in Contributions to Philosophy. So that doesn't mean that God creates himself out of nothing or sort of pulls himself up by his own bootstraps, uh, so to speak. It means that God is self-explanatory, that his essence is necessary. This is a conception that is familiar from thinkers like Anselm and other scholastic philosopher theologians. God's essence is self-explanatory. He is a necessary being. He is his own explanation. He exists of necessity. So being, which consists in having an ultimate explanation, is what is common to both creatures who have their ultimate explanation, ultimate explanation in God, and God who has his ultimate explanation in himself. Now, immediately you might begin to have a little bit of a doubt here, because isn't Heidegger rejecting metaphysics? So why would he draw upon this particular metaphysical connection of causa sui, you know, in discussing this or presenting or suggesting this third proto-theology according to which God is a particular being. Well, he, there's a reason that he might be forced in this direction, though, because we might want to ask, well, what is it, if God is a being like all these other beings, exactly what is it about God that makes him divine, whereas these are non-divine beings? What does the divine, non-divine distinction come to in this third, I'm uh, sorry, this first proto-theology according to which God is a being. What makes God divine? Now, the metaphysical conception has a ready answer to that question. God, unlike any other being, is self-explanatory. Every other being, which is a creature, has its explanation in God's causal or God's creative activity. But it is true that Heidegger wants to distance himself from this or any other metaphysical conception where he understands that, as I said earlier, as a kind of maximally general characteristic or the attribution of a maximally general characteristic to all beings. It's what all beings, the most general characteristic that they have in common. He doesn't want to have anything to do with that, especially in his later writings. And so he, he would probably he would want to reject this metaphysical picture that I just set forth in terms of causa sui. And there are places in Heidegger's later writings where he does suggest that God is a being, or that gods are beings, without drawing upon any kind of metaphysical conception. I have in mind in particular a passage from Heidegger's essay, The Thing, that's in Poetry, Language, and Thought, that collection of essays. He writes, But on the earth already means under the sky. Both of these are already, I'm sorry, both of these already, also already mean remaining before the divinities, and include a belonging to men's being with one another. By a primal oneness, the four, earth and sky, divinities and mortals, belong together in one. So notice that he's treating divinities here, notice that he speaks in the plural, he's treating the divinities or gods alongside, or he's putting them on a level alongside beings. Earth is a being, sky is a being, mortals are beings. So he seems to be treating God like a being, or gods. 
like a being. Divinities. But Heidegger makes it very clear in that same essay that he wants to say that the word world here, in which the fourfold occurs, is now no longer used in the metaphysical sense. So he's rejecting any metaphysical notion of world or any metaphysical notion of being as that what's, which is common to all beings. So the problem, though, here is that if he does not avail himself of that metaphysical conception of causa sui or having an ultimate explanation, either in God or in itself, I'm sorry, either in God or God has his own ultimate explanation, if Heidegger does not adopt that, then he's left without any way of explaining the difference between divinity and non-divinity. What, it is, what is it about the divinities? Okay, here he speaks in the plural, but he still treats them as gods. Well, what makes them divinities, as opposed to the other non-divine things that he mentioned in that first, that passage, first passage from the thing that I read? He doesn't give any answer, and by rejecting the metaphysical picture of causa sui, or having an ultimate explanation, either in God or in the case of God in itself, if he rejects all of that, then he leaves himself without any way of explaining what the non-divine, divine distinction consists in. So that's a very serious problem with the first proto-theology that arises from considerations that Heidegger himself sets forth. Now, let's turn to the second proto-theology. Remember that according to this proto-theology, God is not a particular being. God is being, per se. He is the same as being. And let's quickly hasten to add that here Heidegger wants to understand being non-metaphysically as the event of appropriation. Sometimes he calls it that. And so we're going to come back to what he has in mind by that later. But for now, just to fix ideas, let's consider the proto-theology that Heidegger, according to which he suggests, according to which being and the holy are the same. Remember that he mentioned, I think I mentioned this or quoted this passage last time, that he, he seems to identify in the Ister lecture, the lecture on the great lyric poem by Friedrich Hölderlin, that God and being are the same. He says that the gods are without feeling of themselves, that is, remaining within their own essence, they are never able to comport themselves toward beings. For this, a relation to being is required, i.e., to the holy, that is, beyond them. So here, the holy and being are being identified. Now, there's a very straightforward problem with this, at least initially, this proto-theology, number two. If being and the holy are the same, then all beings stand vis-a-vis -vis the holy in the same relation that they stand to being, because being and the holy are the same. So then one might reasonably ask, well, doesn't it follow, then, that all beings, the rocks, the trees, the sticks, everything else, are holy, are gods? because being and the holy are the same. So all of those things have being, and being is the holy, so all of those things are holy. And that would be a very ridiculous and counterintuitive polytheism that Heidegger would reject. He says, in fact, in Contributions to Philosophy, he makes it very clear that we do not count gods. We don't do that. Even though he speaks of the gods in the plural sometimes, he doesn't want to count gods. Well, we'd be counting a whole lot of them if it turned out that everything was holy, that is, if every, every being was a god. Or it could go the other way. It, if, it could, if, if the holy is the same as being, and these non-holy non beings stand in the same relation to being as they do to the holy, and God is like them, then why is he divine? Once again, we lose the sense in which God is a holy being, is a divine being, because the holy and the being are one, and all these other beings besides God are certainly not gods. And so if God stands in the same relation to being as they do, then he's not really a god either, and that also is an unsatisfactory consequence. Now there is one way that Heidegger might try to finagle this in the second proto-theology. He might say, well look, what I really mean here is that uh, God, the holy, is the same as being. Okay? But that doesn't mean that all beings turn out to be divine. The only thing that's divine is being itself. And because beings are not the same as being, they are not the same as the holy. Okay? So that 
we could, and in a way, this is similar to St. Thomas Aquinas's view that being is pure. I'm sorry, that God is pure act and pure being. Uh, it, and here, Heidegger would, of course, want to avoid any kind of metaphysical presuppositions that he detects in Aquinas. But the idea is that being and the holy are one, and that no particular being is the same as being itself, and so no particular being is the same as the holy itself, and so we don't have the unwanted consequence that all beings, like rocks, trees, you and I, are gods. It just doesn't follow. But there's another problem here. And that is that Heidegger makes it clear also in his later writings that he wants to see being, as in some sense not metaphysically understood, as something that the holy needs. And just to anticipate a little bit, this, and we're going to try to unpack this claim in considerable more detail later in the lecture series, but he does think that being is needed by the holy. He says, in, again, in Contributions to Philosophy, being is the between amidst beings and the gods, utterly and in every respect incomparable. It is needed by the gods and withdrawn from beings. In another place, he talks about being in terms of measure-taking, or a metron. He says that this measure-taking not only takes the measure of the earth, gi, which is the Greek word for that, and accordingly it is no mere geometry, just as little does it ever take the measure of heaven, uralus, for itself. Measure-taking is no science. Measure-taking gauges the between, there's that word again, which brings the two, heaven and earth, to one another. The measure-taking has its own metron and is its own measure. So it looks like non-metaphysical being is like the metron for everything. Beings and the holy, and, and all, all particular beings, as well as the holy, the divinities, earth, sky, mortals, and so forth. Now, the measure, in this case non-metaphysical being, this event of an appropriation that Heidegger describes, the measure, what, what measures, is not the same thing as what it measures. A measure has to be distinct from what it measures. A ruler, in order to measure something else, is distinct from it. So if being, non-metaphysical being, is the measure for not only non-holy beings, but also for the gods, because in some sense the gods need, or the holy needs being as a non-metaphysical measure. If that's true, then the second proto-theology has to be wrong. It can't be that non-metaphysical being, non-metaphysical being construed as a measure or a metron, is the same as the holy, because a measure is not the same thing as what it measures. That's a very problematic idea. So what we've seen so far is that these first two proto-theologies are suggested by certain things that Heidegger says, but that each one of them faces difficulties within the context of Heidegger's own philosophy. Next time, we're going to turn to the third proto-theology and attempt to explain why it's preferable to the other two, in that it avoids these problems even though it faces some problems of its own, a very considerable problem. So that's all for today. Thank you for joining me. I hope you'll tune in next time. Uh, this is Black Cat Theology signing off, and I hope you have a good day. Thank you.